Hi. It's very lonely being a statistician sometimes. You know what would make a cool thumbnail is if I could uh, show a video of me crying. That would be awesome. <laughs> Actually, I do acting on the side, and I did learn how to cry on command. It just takes a bit. Let me see if I could do it. So the technique is to yawn and look at a light source to irritate your eyes and not blink because then your eyes start to get watery. So I've done shows before where right before a scene, I'm standing off stage and I'm just looking at the spotlights. Yawning repeatedly. <laughs> of course, there are some scenes that are genuinely sad and then I don't have to fake it. Those are the best scenes. You also have to be pretty well hydrated for it to work. Oh, my eyes getting watery. I got a tear. <laughs> How's that? <laughs> but yeah, being a statistician is lonely. This is totally unscripted, by the way, so this might not go well, but we'll see. Um, here's why it sucks to be a statistician. Um, well, there's, there's actually several reasons. One is that, um, I think the most frustrating thing is because you work with people who use stats every day. Uh, at least if you're in a research setting, you work with people who use stats every day. And because they use stats every day, they think they're experts when they're not. And I hate to sound condescending. I'm not intending to be condescending, but this is my area of expertise. And you use it as a tool. I develop tools. The level of expertise is very different between them and me. But they tend to forget that. And so even though they're asking for your help so often, they just don't want to hear what you have to say because a lot of what we have to say is, yeah, that's not a good way of doing things. You're going to bias things. Like, for example... One thing that people frequently want to do, especially in uh, biostats, when I worked as a biostatistician, people frequently wanted to dichotomize a variable that you have like, um, I don't know, like a variable that indicates uh, like a biomarker of some sort, like a, a cytokine that has maybe a normal distribution, maybe not, but still it has a continuum of levels. And they kept saying, all right, what is positive? And I'd say, that doesn't make sense. They say, what do you mean it doesn't make sense? I'm like, it's a continuous variable. It's not positive or negative. It's continuous. They say, well, where can we cut it in an optimal way to differentiate those who have lupus, which is what I did research in, versus those who don't? I'm like, okay, let me ask you a similar question. Um, how tall is tall? And they'd say, that's a stupid question. I'd say, exactly. <laughs> like, what is the cutoff? Is it 5'9", 5'10", 5'11", 6 feet? There is no tall. I mean, it, it's a continuous variable. It doesn't make sense to dichotomize it. And when you do dichotomize, so let's stick with height. Let's say the cutoff is six feet. So if you're six feet or above, you're tall. If you're 5'11 or below, you're short. So you're meaning to tell me that somebody who is 5'11 is very, very different from somebody who is six feet. But somebody who is six feet is the same height as somebody who's seven foot eight? Are you kidding me? No. But that's what happens when we dichotomize variables. And so I'll frequently get people who say, oh, I'm going to cut this in half and then analyze the dichotomous version of this variable. I'm like, no, that's a very bad idea. You're just introducing unreliability. And then frequently they say, well, that's what everybody else says. I'm like, yeah, well, everybody else is dumb. <laughs> what do you want me to say? In fact, one time, um, so when I first got hired as a biostatistician, the person who hired me said, we need somebody like you to come in and to keep us honest. I'm like, great, this is exactly the place that I want to work at because I want to be honest. But then as soon as they'd start recommending doing these stupid things like median splits, I'd say, no, we shouldn't do that. They'd say, well, we're doing it anyway. I'm like, hey, you hired me to keep you honest and I'm trying to keep you honest and you're telling me no. And so in just about every consulting, every consulting job that I've had, every sort of opportunity I've had to give people insight, I always run into something where they don't like what I'm saying. 
And I keep having to be the bearer of bad news. Like, you can't do that. That is not a good thing to do. And a lot of it crosses ethical boundaries, but they don't know that. And if I tell them it crosses ethical boundaries, then they feel like I'm accusing them of being unethical. I'm like, no, you're not being unethical because you don't know any better. But it would be unethical for me to allow this to happen. I'm not going to allow this to happen. And I just feel bad for the people whose livelihood depends on that. Because if you keep telling people they can't do it that way, you're not going to get hired. And that actually happened to me as a graduate student. There was a woman. <sighs> she really upset me. Um, she hired me to help her with her data analysis. And she was asking me to do something that I said, no, this, this breaches ethical boundaries. I can't do it. And she said, it's a simple thing. I just need you to do this. I'm like, you don't understand. This is like a bad thing to do. And at this point I've been doing, I'd probably put in 40 hours of work to help her with her analysis. And because I refused to do this unethical thing, she refused to pay me for the work that I did. And so, I mean, as a graduate student, that was 800 bucks. I remember the amount. I don't remember the exact number of hours that I worked, but it was 800 bucks and she refused to pay me. And I actually had to take her to court and sue her. And I ended up losing because she was rich and I wasn't, which really sucked. So I lost 800 bucks because I had a conscience. That sucks. And I've also had other colleagues where um, I've been on, I think it was a thesis or a dissertation committee where um, some girl was doing a longitudinal analysis and they wanted to analyze the data as if it were just a regular regression model and ignore the fact that there were repeated measures. And I said, okay, um, you cannot do that. Um, you're violating the assumption of independence. You have to analyze this as a mixed model. And her advisor said to me, look, I understand you're a statistician. You want to flex your statistical muscles and show these kind of complex models. But look, we're just simple people. We just want to do simple models. And that really annoyed me that I was being accused of showing off when it wasn't about showing off. It was just you had the wrong model. Like, no, it's not showing off. You can't analyze repeated measures data as if it's not repeated measures data. But I think my biggest frustration lately is um, anybody who's a longtime viewer of this channel knows that uh, I'm really frustrated by how um, statistics is currently taught with this t-test, ANOVA, regression, chi-square, that these stupid decision trees that make these distinctions that aren't important at all. We could just analyze everything as a linear model and it would simplify everything immensely. And so I have worked for years with my own department to convince them that a linear model approach is easier. But the problem is everybody in my department was trained under the decision tree way and they cannot conceive that it would be easier to teach one model than it would be to teach 15 models. And so despite me being the only statistician in the department, despite me, despite this being my area of expertise, time and time again, I get overruled. I can't even convince my own department. And in the process of this, I have people saying, I've been teaching stats for 15 years. I'm like, yeah, teaching stats is very different than having a PhD in statistics or in quantitative psychology or in biostats or whatever. Very different skill set. And teaching stats doesn't mean that you're keeping up with the stats literature. But again, it goes back to that idea that, hey, I use statistics every day, therefore I'm an expert. Like, no, it's, it's not the same. And I hate to say that, like I hate to, I hate to sound like I'm whining, first of all, and I hate to sound, I hate to discount somebody else's expertise because I've had that happen before where people discount my expertise and it's frustrating. Um, but surely you can see that if you get a degree in statistics and you read the statistics literature on a daily basis and you publish in the statistics literature, that gives you much better qualifications to write a stats curriculum than teaching stats once a year. Yeah, and I think, I think one of the most discouraging things about this is that everybody has their own incentive. Um, 
that somebody who's seeking consulting with you for a paper, for example, they want to get this thing published. And the stats that would make it easiest to publish are not going to be the ones that make it most accurate. And they're not going to be the ones that tell you the most information about your data. And so very often, the shortcut is going to bias your results and it's going to give you misleading information, but it's going to be the easiest way to get published. And so I am constantly in the position of having to tell somebody that I know this is the easiest way for you. This is going to be a misleading way of doing it. And I guess one other thing that bothers me, and this has happened in my last two jobs, where people don't see stats expertise as real expertise. So when I worked as a biostatistician, it was like, well, you're not a scientist. You know, you don't do research into diseases. Therefore, you don't get these perks or whatever. I'm like, hey, I went to graduate school just as long as these people did. Like, can't we just agree that our expertise is just different, that we're both scientists? And I think some people have this misconception that stats is the static thing, that we discovered stats and we're done discovering stats. I'm like, no, stats continues to progress like any other science. We develop new methods, new techniques. We learn, about, we learn new things about the old techniques. We learn better ways of doing things. And stats progresses just like any other scientific field does. So why do I do it? I don't know. You know, it was interesting. I, I started doing stats. I think one of the appeals to me was I saw um, the resident statistician in my undergraduate institution that he had his hands in so many projects because everybody was asking him for help. And I'm like, that sounds interesting because I had a hard time deciding what I was interested in because I was interested in everything. And I thought that'd be cool to be in a position where I get to have my hands in lots of different projects. Um, I don't feel that way anymore. Uh, I mean, it is interesting that I get to have my hands on a lot of different projects. But the cost of doing it is just too high. <laughs> the cost of, ha I mean, having to be the bad guy all the time. I don't like being the bad guy. In real life, I'm a, I'm a nice guy. <laughs> I'm an accommodating guy. I'm an agreeable guy. I don't like conflict. And so having to be put in that position where you're always telling people that they're doing it wrong. I don't know. Some people thrive on that. I don't. Now, having said that, there is some truth. Like, there are some statisticians that are very rigid in their thinking and um, like, let me think of an example. Uh, like technically um, all of our statistics assume a simple random sample from the general population. That's the first thing I could think of. It's probably not the best example, but um, so there's some statisticians out there that uh, sit in their high tower and say, I'm not going to help you analyze your data because that didn't come from a simple random sample. Um, now, there is a big part of me that is like super practical and say, hey, um, yeah, some of these statistical models we use are super idealized and assume conditions that you're never going to meet in the real world. Now, I'm not like that. Like, I recognize that we live in a world where things can't be perfect and that's okay. Um, and so even though I know that this model might not be the best model and we haven't perfectly met all the assumptions... I hope we can at least gl glean some information, but my big problem is when there is a better way of doing things and people refuse to accept the better way because everybody else does it the easy but wrong way. Anyway, like I said, this video is very unscripted. And there's a big part of me that is second guessing whether I should even publish this video because I don't want to come across as a whiner. And I don't want to come across like I'm talking smack about my colleagues because I'm not. Uh, my colleagues are great people. I just hate having to be the bearer of bad news all the time. And by the way, usually when I push back, they're accommodating. But I still hate the fact that I have to push back. I don't want – like I said, I just like to be a nice guy. I like to be accommodating, but I can't be accommodating in my profession. It just doesn't happen. So what advice do I have for statisticians? Um, 
don't do it. <laughs> Just kidding. I have a friend who is a musician. And when aspiring musicians ask him what his advice is, he says, don't be a musician. And we talked about this and I said, why would you say that? And would you give that advice to yourself? He's like, absolutely, but I'd ignore the advice. And if you're the type of person who is willing to ignore the advice, then that tells me you have passion enough to be a musician. And I'm like, that's a good perspective. Maybe I have the same thing that like, maybe I would recommend don't try to become a statistician. But if that doesn't deter you, then maybe you're built to be a statistician because it really is. I mean, it is fun. <laughs> I do. I do enjoy the puzzles and um, I enjoy the excitement of seeing a new data set and trying to figure out, all right, what what kind of insights can I glean from this? It's a lot of fun. Um, I just don't enjoy that aspect of it, you know, and it really is cool when um, you know, it's like when you Google yourself. Um, I will Google, look at reverse citations for my papers and say, wow, that is cool. My tools are being used to do cancer research and to do education research and to do criminology research. And that's really cool. Um, there is that part of me that like longs for recognition that like, man, if I had chosen uh, to be a medical researcher or to be a physicist, I'd probably be giving TED Talks and I'd be, you know, signing book contracts and I'd be, I'd be known. But instead I developed the tools that those people use to get their stuff. So I don't get the credit. And... But you know what? I'm okay with it. So yeah, if you're in that position, I feel for you. And I'd say the best thing you could do is regularly meet with other people that are in the same situation. Yeah, my very first job out of graduate school, I was working as a biostatistician and I felt so out of place having to constantly tell these medical researchers that they're doing things wrong. And on one of these projects, I got to collaborate with a woman, old woman, she was like in her... 70s or 80s um, biostatistician named Barbara Neese. I'm not even sure if she's still around. She was fantastic, though. I loved her. And talking with her was so validating. And so it, it was amazing. Um, because I said, hey, again, going back to this median split thing, I said, does it drive you nuts um, when people ask you to do a median split and she's, you should have seen this like 80 year old woman go, ah, it drives me absolutely crazy. And then we had like a, an hour long venting session about all the things that we're asked to do that drive us nuts. So, and, um, having that experience, I was like, okay, I can keep doing this. This is okay. Uh, so yeah, I, if you're in that situation, it, I mean, it's it's easy to feel alone when you are the only statistician in the department. Um, and if you are in that situation, then find opportunities to meet with other statisticians. Some of my favorite things to do, especially in graduate school, was uh, get in a room with fellow collaborators and just write things on the board and uh, brainstorm ideas about how to do research and also just vent about the way other people are doing things. It was just fantastic. And I can't let this opportunity go without putting a plug for Simplistics. Like, that's another thing you can do. Join the Simplistics community. Not only taking classes, because there's lots of classes, but hopefully um, you find a sense of community there because there's discussion boards and you get to hang out with me and that's cool. Makes me wonder if I had to put a forum on there. <laughs> a venting forum. Or you vent about your statistical woes. I don't know. Let me know if you like this kind of video. Uh, it's like I said, I'm not even sure if I'm going to publish this video. But if I do, let me know if you want to see more of this. And maybe I'll vent more. I don't know. <laughs> we'll see. Anyway, peace out.